Hey everyone, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. If this is your first time here, I appreciate you taking a moment to download us. Um, it's this eclectic DIY show. I have a YouTube channel called Garden Fork and I get together my friends and we talk about stuff we've done, something you might be interested in. So welcome, thanks for taking the time. Everyone else, you remember my guest today, it's Will, who has the YouTube channel, The Weekend Homestead. Hey man. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. Everyone, I had to tell Will to stop talking because he kept talking before we were recording and he was saying a lot of good stuff. So um, it's all pent up in him now and it will come out like Niagara Falls, right? I'll try to pace myself this time so we don't end up with a two hour show and you have to edit it down again. <laughs> I hate editing audio. It's such a pain. I'm trying you, to give. You can't see the picture. You can only see the waveform, you know. When you're right. editing video, it's easy because you're like, oh, well, it happens when that thing happened, you know, so. I was just trying to give Rick a run for his money, you know. Yeah. Rick will be on the show as well. Um, we're going to talk. Uh, he's back from his social media hiatus, which you talked about last time. But uh, he's kind of like my garden guru now. So that'd be good. I will say this. I'm kind of jealous of everybody right now and their gardening stuff. So I live in zone 3A, 3B, and... Right now, we literally, last week, we had a little bit of snow in the yard, and the frost is starting to come out of the ground, and I'm looking online to people posting in the Garden Fork group and other places online, and they're posting, hey, look at my tulips are coming up, or my garden is coming together, and here I am, you know, scraping, you know, the slushy mud off the ground that everybody did a couple months ago, so hopefully I'll start gardening here by Memorial Day. I did get some, uh, I put sugar snap peas in, I bought... I bought some plants, actually, at the, the garden center was growing, and then I also put in seed as well. It's kind of a, so I'll have hopefully two flows this spring before it gets too hot and they burn out. So sugar peas are great. We have a video about it, of course. So Yeah, actually, speaking of your videos, uh, my wife was watching your one about cold frames and we had, because of our remodel, I have all the windows from when we did that. So she's been kind of bugging me to put together a cold frame. So my hope is in the next week here, I'll get one put together and we can, you know, try that out since our growing season is a lot different than everybody else's. Yeah, I um I have a way too many storm windows. Uh, the gentleman who built my house and lived in it for fifty years, we call it Mike's house. Um, he collected things, and one of them was storm windows because they don't fit anywhere in the house. But um, he did build, and I used this greenhouse out of these giant windows, these used windows. But I still have all these others, and I ca I just want to get rid of them. But I'm like, oh, but I could build something, you know, like another greenhouse or something. So that's my quandary right now and trying to trying to declutter and be minimalist, you know. I know you and I talk about Craigslist a lot, but have you ever thought about doing a barter on Craigslist for something that you wanted or even selling them on Craigslist and then you, using the money to buy something else for the garden that you don't already have? Oh, I never thought of that. I didn't think of the barter thing. I was just going to put them at the edge of the driveway with a free sign. <laughs> No, yeah. there's a lot of guys who barter, barter out on Craigslist. I mean, that's that's kind of how my world works. You know, a lot of the construction project we did and a lot of the things that came out of the house, all that stuff went on Craigslist. And it's like, hey, would you give me $25 for this or $50? You put the number low enough. If they show up and they go, you know what, I'll give you 20 bucks. Okay, great. It's better than, you know, just giving it away or throwing it in the dumpster. So you yeah, get a little lunch. something for it. At least you could buy dinner, you know. I gave away uh, one of my metal filing cabinets because I I think I'm done making file cabinet evaporators. So <laughs> I had one uh, left over and I was like, it's just got to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see that. I, I see an operation of multiple file cabinets and doing a, a lot of different boiling and, and things like that in your near future. I just for some reason, it seems like you like to do that. And you were talking about that steel pan that you guys had that you had produced. And how did that end up working on your file cabinet? Did that work pretty good? The pan was great. The problem was the fire ran too hot and all the heat went out the chimney. So I boiled sap, but I burned a lot of wood really fast. And speaking with my maple syrup old timer friends, you actually, um, one guy has a mound of sand in the firebox on the way to the chimney stack, which creates turbulence and causes the heat to linger a little long. And these other guys have metal baffles in the firebox on the way to the chimney which will slow down the heat flow. And so then more heat is transferred to the pan. So I have to look into that. There's a, there's a discussion forum on a site called mapletapper.com. And I was going to ask there, but it, you, it went well, but I just burned way too much wood for the amount of sap that I boiled. So 
Have you ever considered, I've seen a couple guys where they take coil, like copper pipe, and they coil it, and then they run it over the edge of the, the chimney or even down the chimney, and then they use that as their warming. So the sap flows through the copper and kind of goes through the It's like the a chimney. preheater. Yeah, and then it dumps in, and that's how they kind of reclaim some of that heat. Yeah, I can tell you that wrapping the copper around the outside of the chimney does not work very well. It, it barely raises the temperature. Um, putting it inside the stack might work better. Um, I've got a couple ideas about that that I'm going to play with in the fall, but I, uh, I might just mount another tray over the back of the, the basically where the finishing area is of the evaporator. Cause that's where the most heat is. And, and my friends that have a tray like that, that thing warms up really hot. So it's almost like a double boiler. So I'm going to uh, try that out. We'll see. Very cool. I, I do have one last thing to talk about sap and then we can move on. So I we talked about last time that I was tapping my birch trees to try making birch syrup this year. And I actually have an update on that. Yeah. We went through maple syrup season. It was a little bit slower than we usually have just because our season was up and down. And I put out the buckets for the, the birch and we went weeks. We waited. We're like, oh, man, the maple syrup is flowing. Why isn't the birch? And we we're on the last day of doing the... Um, uh, maple syrup and we went over to the birch trees to go pick up the buckets thinking they were done and they were full so in a week's time period all of a sudden boom we've got all these five gallon buckets we boiled it down to the pre-level which is you know we take most of the liquid out and then you yep. take it inside and finish it so right now in the basement i have a stainless steel crock pot that this weekend we're going to boil down hopefully the rest of the way and finish it and everything i've been reading online you know how maple syrup you try to bring it to like uh, uh, 219, everything I've been reading online that uh, birch syrup, you need to bring it to 225 to get the same uh, production out of it. The worry I have is, you know, when you boil maple syrup down, it has that nice, great smell to it. And it's just, it smells great. When yeah. we boiled down the birch, it didn't really smell like anything. It just kind of turned into a, a brownish liquid and it, it, it looks just like maple syrup, but it doesn't have that odor as it burns off. So who knows? We might work out. It might not. It might be a huge failure. It might be a great success. We'll find out this weekend. Did you taste it? You know, I tried it and it had a little bit of a flavor to it, but it was kind of a little bit of a funky flavor. So oh. I, I I, don't know. Maybe it's too, I think they call it buddy or something like that, where like the buds are coming out and maybe we missed the flow or something like that. But if we fail, we'll try again next year. But it was a cool experiment to try anyways. Also, it might have started to go punky after sitting in the buckets on the tree for a week. So... Well, the one thing is, though, that week we had pretty cold temperatures, so oh, okay. uh, it, it, it's been weird weather. Like, we had 72 degrees for a period of time, and then it dropped to the 30s, and then it snowed, and then it went back up to the 60s, and then it was down in the 40s and 30s. So it's been, we've had really crazy weather. That's why we still had snow in the yard in some spots about two weeks ago. All right. Yeah, I by the time sir, maple syrup season's done, I have no desire to tap any more trees. <laughs> so... You get, you get kind of burned out on it a little bit. Yeah. I work alone. You know, there's really maybe a friend will show up every once in a while, but you you have the whole team there. So, Well, I, I, I what I do is I post something on Facebook to trick everybody to come over and talk them into doing it, and then they, they figure out what it is, and then for some reason they don't come back the next year. Yeah. I don't know what it is. You, you get one shot, so you just kind of have to keep working your way through it. Uh -huh. I joke, but it's fun, you know. All right, what's next? Um, we were going to talk, uh, so we were talking offline before the show about your last bee video with the dead bees. And one of the comments that I was making was, you know, the video itself, everybody seems to post, and there's nothing wrong with this, but everybody seems to post online and YouTube all the glory and the sunshine. Look at the golden honey, and here's the bees coming in and out and everything like that. But, you know, everything I read on the forums and things like that, people have problems where hives die, but nobody ever really covers it or talks about why or shows what it looks like or anything like that. So it was really refreshing that you you had put that video out and helped me because I'm considering doing bees, but I know it's not easy. And I think I know what I'm getting into, but it's kind of like you finished the cycle. You know, you, you showed what happens when it isn't all rays of sunshine and golden honey. Yeah, we had a we had a 50% loss rate this year. My, my neighbor had a 30% loss rate. So it's... um. This hive that we took apart, I figured out what was wrong, and it wasn't something that I did. I think I think most bees die because of beekeeper error. Um, and there's just so much what I would call not fake news about how to just kind of not. There's a lot of different 
information about raising bees and whether it really works or not is another story. You know, on the internet, you can find whatever answer you're looking for. So um, I thought I had done everything right throughout the year, and we just had a cold snap. And the bees had started laying what's called brood. They started laying eggs. And the nurse bees will not leave those eggs. They will keep them warm no matter what. And we had a cold. So they had the 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 uh, yard was starting to warm up. The bees got the queen to start laying some eggs. And then all of a sudden it got really cold. And there weren't enough of a bee population to cover all the brood. In other words, to cover all the eggs and keep them warm in the comb and cluster around the queen. So um, they died because if you don't have enough of a cluster, the bees will freeze to death. Um, so that was kind of a bummer. <laughs> it, it, okay, so since I have your ear right now and we have the listeners, um, I'm thinking about doing bees. And you, the first comment you said when you started this was, you know, a lot of beekeepers probably kill their own bees. And I, I believe it. I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of trial and error. I hate to say it. No matter how prepared you are and how many books you read, you're dealing with something that, you're, you're trying to control that's been naturally out of control or doing its own thing for years. So if you could make one recommendation to a person like myself where I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to build all the boxes and get ready. So next year we can dive into having bees on our property. What's the mistake that you think is commonly made? People don't take a class or work with a mentor. Well, I think you and I'll be talking more closer to next year. Yeah. No, but just hands on. Like I, there's a, a my neighbor, um, through a friend, uh, another, another neighbor emailed me and said, hey, uh, this person wants to learn beekeeping. Could I give you her contact info? Sure. And I, she said, oh, I just, I don't know if I want to do it, but I'd like to come along and learn. So she came the other day and she thought she was just going to stand around. I'm like, I'm like, no, <laughs> here, grab this, you know, and she's holding frames full of bees and stuff. And uh, I, you know, I just kind of yammered while I did it, but I, most I would say 99% of beekeepers will not say no to anyone saying, could I come along and help uh, and learn? Or there's beekeeping associations, not quite everywhere in the United States, but and they off, most offer a free, some charge for their classes. Or there might be a beekeeper around who part of making his living, so there's nothing wrong with this, charges money for the class. It might be $300. Um, they might make their money actually selling you the bee equipment, which is okay as well. But that knowledge is so much better than reading a book or watching Garden Fork videos. Um, well, let, let me ask you this. So I was doing some research and up where our place is, you know, we're a couple hours away from, you know, the cities. Um, when we were in the city, I, I, you get that magazine in the mail that says, hey, here's what the classes are at the community college or here's the evening courses or, you know, yep. how to repair, whatever. And in there they had a beginning beekeeping course and actually then they had a step up like you know, second version, you know, you've done the beginning. Now let's take the next level. Um, do you, what do you think of those types of classes? Do, is, is that a better way to go? Or is it better to find, you know, an apple orchard where they got tons of bees and you go and talk to the guy there and say, Hey, can I see what you're doing? Which is kind of a better way? Boy, it's a coin toss, you know, it just depends on, I mean, the class, you'll learn a lot more of the, the nuts and bolts of the life cycle of bees probably. Um, but boy, the hands-on experience is not to be, uh, yeah, the cool thing about working with the mentor guy is if, if they're, I, I'm or a woman, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, um, is that you might be able to text them a year from now and go, hey, I got this problem, you know, what should, because you know, the class teacher might not be as available, but um, okay, good, I would just good, go whatever good. feels right. I mean, if there's a class and and you feel a little awkward about calling up a beekeeper, just take the class and you might, maybe you meet some beekeepers from that, you know? Well, that's kind of what I was thinking is, is the class is $25. My wife and I were thinking of going and taking it just kind of as a date night to go out. It's, you know, two different classes on, like there's a Tuesday and then a Thursday that you take the class. And I thought, you know, by going there and mixing with other people who are like-minded about, you know, beekeeping, you know, maybe I can find some friends that are local that I can start tapping and saying, Hey, you're a beginner just like I am. What have you experienced? And we kind of share stuff back and forth because it's always there's a lot more fun in doing things when you have a couple people doing it with you versus necessarily always doing things on your own. Yeah, we actually have a um, I put together in Google. We made a little Google group for what I call the urban beekeepers of New York City. And there's like 20 of us. And we just kind of someone's like, hey, I need help requeening because when you have to find the queen in a hive of, you know, 60, 80,000 bees, um, 
it helps to have extra eyeballs and people will come, you know, if they have a Saturday, an hour on a Saturday, they'll come over and try and help you find the queen. And that that's great. It's just the people in the class will, will want to help each other. So I love that. The pro- My biggest problem with beekeeping is people read something on the web that it's much like news these days. Uh, you, you read the news that confirms your preconceived notions of the world rather than taking uh, watching news that has an opposing viewpoint to you that actually might be more correct. Um, so um, you read on the web, oh, you don't have to treat for mites, only the strong bees will survive. And so you're like, oh, I don't treat for mites. And, I'm, and this is controversial. I'm like, well, then you'll have dead bees, you know. Um, but yeah, there's I've, a lot I've of, y- that. A lot of I, young people, a lot of young new beekeepers are like, oh, well, I just need to use powdered sugar. That'll kill the mites. I'm like, well, the mites are in the honeycomb cells. They're not crawling around where you can exp- – and I was wrong. I made a whole video about this, and I deleted it actually. So it's there's so much misinformation out there about beekeeping is my problem. <laughs> so you're saying keep the powdered sugar for baking and skip it for the bees. Yeah. But like with the dead bee video, there were – they were innocent enough questions, but people are like, well, well, you shouldn't you have fed them brown sugar instead of white sugar? But they don't realize that brown sugar is, has molasses in it, which which will kill your bees. Um, but they don't know. And they're like, oh, well, Eric, the white sugar is what killed the bees. I'm like, no, it's not. It's a, it's a pure, a fairly pure form of sugar that is kind of close to uh, natural sugar, and it'll keep them alive. It's not the perfect solution, but the perfect solution is honey. But if you don't have any honey from last year because there was a ne- there wasn't a nectar flow because of the drought, you know. Hey everyone, real quick, I just wanted to remind you and ask basically if you would consider supporting Garden Fork. There's a couple ways you can do that. Um, it does take money and time for me to create all this stuff, and I love doing it, and I love sharing it, and I love that you guys like it. And if you had the time and the money. If you don't have the money, that's totally okay. Um, There's a couple ways you can help Garden Fork. You can become one of our Patreon patrons. It's kind of like the PBS model where you do a monthly contribution to keep Garden Fork going. There's a link in our show notes about that. You can also go to patreon.com slash Garden Fork. Or you can help out Garden Fork when you shop on Amazon. The easiest way to do that is to use this URL. It's gardenfork.tv slash Amazon. That will take you directly to Amazon with a little, uh, I'm blanking on the thing, um, a little cookie thing that tells Amazon that you came from Garden Fork. And we get a little sales commission on your purchases. It doesn't affect the price that you guys pay and it does help us. Um, gardenfork.tv slash Amazon or click on any of the Amazon ads on our website or in the uh, iTunes podcast information section. There's always a little info section that comes with the podcast there. And there you go. You could help Garden Fork. All right, let's go back to the show. Are you cool with changing topics? I'd like to talk about your Troy built trip. I saw you uh, posted some pictures of you actually saw all your videos. You wear a black shirt. And I think I gave you a little guff online that you were wearing a red shirt at the Troy built event. And then Aaron weighed in and say, nope, he had the black one underneath in case he needed to go incognito. (laughs) So what was that all about? What was that trip about? Well, if you pay me enough, I'll wear a red shirt. Well, (laughs) yeah, the checks in the mail. (laughs) No, that uh, Troy built is our big sponsor. They, um, I'm one of their brand ambassadors, and this is the third year they've asked me back, and I thought that was pretty cool. And once a year, they there's 10 brand ambassadors this year, and Aaron, who's been on the show as well, is one of them, and Kenny from uh, Veggie Garden Tips has been on as well. And we went to Savannah, Georgia to do a community project, and we worked on a botanic garden that is all volunteer-run. They don't get a lot of donations. They don't have a lot of high-dollar donors. It's it's uh, very grassroots. It's called the Savannah Garden Club Association Botanic Garden, I believe. I might be mangling the name. But it's kind of a way to get the blogger, you know, the brand ambassadors, the garden bloggers to bond and get to know each other. And we get to talk with the Troy Built people about the products. And um, Troy Built donated... Uh, 
rototiller, a lawnmower, a bunch of hand tools and other power equipment, plus $5,000 to the community, to the botanic garden. And we did spend a day there uh, rebuilding the children's garden. So that was great. It was nice. Did they show you any top secret things that you could share with us that you're going to try out this year? Because I know last year you had the really cool, I saw the video that you had of the weed eater. And then the previous year it was the, the lawnmower power washer thing and things like that. And you always get the coolest gadgets to try from those guys. Can you give us a, a idea of what you're going to see this year? A four wheel drive uh, lawnmower. At this what? Setting. It's four wheel drive self propelled. It's a walk behind, but it's four wheel drive. It wow, has that's going to be nice. And rear wheel drive. And the back wheels are bigger, which I really think is a really good thing for um, walk behind mowers. And it has a Honda engine. And um, I should, I don't know when they're shipping that, but um, I got to try it out down in Georgia. And I talked to the Troy built people who um, helped build it. And um, yeah, I think it'll be, it's, uh, they make, I mean, I wouldn't have signed on with them, but I didn't like the company. And I think they make good products. And, uh, they're a good company. They're 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 a family that's owned by a family, so uh, I think that's pretty cool. It's owned by a company called MTD, which is um, similar to Troy Built. They bought Troy Built. They were both machining companies, and MTD is a family-owned company, and I really like that. And the people that work there, they're they're happy to work there, so that's good. Is that a four-cycle mower then, or two-cycle mower? It's four-cycle. Yeah. So then you don't smell like gasoline when you're done mowing the lawn? Yeah. But I will say, um, you know, I fired up my two of my lawnmowers and my generator last weekend, and they all started up on the first pull because I use gas stabilizer. And I just, I swear by it now. So. Totally. No, I've, uh, I've taken that on too. Even in the fall, we'll go through a cycle where we go through all of our machinery and it takes a little bit of time to do, but if you go through those steps that your stuff will last a lot longer. I mean, I haven't had to replace a lawnmower in a couple of years and like chainsaws and things like that. I mean, we use a lot of that type of stuff up on our property just because of where we are. And, you know, if you take care of that stuff, you know, it'll, it'll keep running forever. Yeah. Especially the two cycle stuff. Um, I actually buy the pre-mixed, uh, two cycle fuel now uh there's one brand which has sponsored us before called true fuel it's not cheap it's like 28 dollars for a gallon of this stuff but in a chainsaw if you're you lug your chainsaw all the way out to the woods and that doesn't start you know what are you gonna do yeah it's it's you know we actually had that happen just recently where um we got a, a storm remember I, I was talking about the temperature hitting high and then it dropped and everything like that and there were some thunderstorms that came through and a couple trees actually went down we lost power up at the house and uh, we got a chance to use our generator and transfer switch in real life but the other problem we had was there were a couple branches that fell right next to the house and we're kind of laying on the garage so we went out to start the chainsaw and to have it start right away and be able to clean that stuff up and take care of that stuff. You know, that's, that's when you need it most is when you got, you know, something like that going on. So I've learned to take care of my stuff. It was a big thing in the fire department. Like every time you have a piece of equipment or something like that, when you brought back to the station, you took care of it because the next time you went on a call, you needed to make sure it was ready to go. So I just kind of got in the habit doing it then. And now I do it in my life on my own personal stuff. Cool. So uh, I've been bugging you about this, but you epoxied your basement floor. I did. It was, uh, I was, I was a little nervous about the project because it, it seemed like you can only get one shot at this and there's a possibility of screwing it up. In all reality, actually it's, it's very simple. The, the biggest thing that I could tell anybody who's considering epoxying the floor, whether it's in your garage or your basement is, um, the prep work is 90% of the work and putting the epoxy down is 10% of the work, yeah. you know, scraping the floor, um, you know, you scrape the floor, you uh, vacuum it off, wash it, uh, you know, you get some filler and fill in any cracks and things like that. Then you, you know, wash the floor again and scrape and clean and so on. Cause once you put the epoxy on, whatever is underneath that epoxy, um, will be stuck there forever. So if you have a bunch of dirt on your floor, you'll just epoxy the dirt right into your floor. And, and if you don't mind doing that, that's fine. But I'd rather kind of have it nice and smooth, especially in the basement. And you did not have the smoothest floor. I, there was, was there some existing paint on that floor? Yeah. So there's, and that's a concern too. Um, you do this test where you take a piece of duct tape and you stick it to the floor and basically rip it off. 
And when you rip it off the floor, if the paint comes off when you rip the duct tape off, then you need to take the paint off the floor. Or if there's dirt on the duct tape when you rip it off, you need to wash the floor more. So you find a couple little test spots and you scrape and you scrub and do all that prep work. Then you take the duct tape, tape it down to the floor, let it sit for a minute, and then rip it off like you're ripping off a Band-Aid. And if there's paint on it or there's dirt or anything else, you have to go back and keep scraping and cleaning beforehand because the epoxy will stick to whatever it's touching. So if you have paint on the floor or if it's concrete or whatever, it'll adhere to that. Well, if your paint, it it adheres to the paint and the paint is not well adhered to the concrete, it's just going to peel right off. And then you're going to have a bunch of problems. And that's actually when I did a bunch of reading and the things I was worried about were from people who probably didn't go through and do the prep work. And that's why they had poor results or had whatever it is. Surprisingly enough, read the instructions and you get a good result. Yeah, because the issue with my floor is that it is a fairly newly poured slab in the basement of our row house. They dug the previous owner dug out the basement and poured a slab, so it's a it's a finished basement. But they didn't put a vapor barrier down before they laid the cement, which is all it is. is pla- it's like six mil plastic, so I get moisture coming up through the cement. And I'm wondering so, if epoxy does epoxy need to have a vapor barrier before you could put it on. So they have some commentary about having a vapor barrier down and they state that if you get a wet floor to the point where the water is puddling on your floor or making a stain that if you put a piece of paper towel on it, that the paper towel picks it up. Right. If your, if your floor is lightly damp, you're okay. And it it should work on some of the heavier epoxies. If you put a piece of paper towel down and the water is absorbed into the paper towel and you get a significant amount of water that. Uh, I think it's called hydraulic pressure of the the water trying to work its way out. Yep. Um, That pressure will eventually wreck the epoxy and push it basically off of the concrete. And the other thing you have to look at on your concrete because it's newer concrete is you may have to etch it, which isn't a big deal. You get this little container that's sold with the, you buy the kit and then you have to maybe buy this little container of an acid that's a light acid that you wash on the floor. And what it does is it, they say it opens the pores of the concrete, yep. which then will accept the, the epoxy a lot better. Yeah, it's muriatic acid. Actually, you use it for cleaning brick after you've done a brick wall. Um, it will actually remove uh, cement from the brick as well. But yeah, etching is a big deal. And it's really easy because it's water soluble. So you etch the floor that's good to know because what i can tell the there's a little there's a tiny bit of moisture because when i put down i have like a rubber floor mat you know those interlocking floor mats on there and i pulled them up and it just looked like there was a little bit of um kind of a powdery mildew underneath and i was like oh well it looks like there was some moisture coming through the cement but there's no puddles there's no it's not wet to the touch so yeah I think you'd actually be okay. And, and I'll tell you, we, it was a 1960s basement. The concrete looked bad. You know, people had spilled stuff on there. There was paint dropped from when they painted something down there and they didn't tarp it or whatever. You got areas where there was spray paint and things like that. And we went from, you know, a floor that just was pitted and had all sorts of issues and things like that to doing, it took me probably three or four hours to do the prep work on the floor. And then I let it dry overnight because you want to make sure your, your floor is bone dry. The next morning, I got up early and I epoxied the floor down in the basement and then my wife got up and she goes, okay, well, we'll have breakfast and you go do the epoxy. I'm like, no, it's drying already. I'm, I'm done. Cause basically you dump it on the floor and take a roller and roll it around. You know, it's, yeah. it's probably the easiest painting you'd ever do. So it's the prep work. That's the tricky part. And I, I can't emphasize it enough that everybody online and all the forms that I read, they complained about the problems that they had, like, oh, this is peeling off or whatever it is. It all came down to how they prepped the floor more than anything else. Good to know. Excellent. And you shot some video, right? I did. Um, I put a small video on the Garden Fork group that actually I also posted on the uh, company that sells the epoxy. I posted on their site and actually it kind of went a little viral with those guys. But I have a how-to video. I have most of it edited. I, I'll be honest, I had a little bit of a problem with a microphone and so I had to go back and fix up a couple things. But I hope we'll have that up here shortly. So I'll uh, send it over to you or link you or whatever and, and you can show it to some folks. All right. Well, cool. Well, we have we have, we have barely got into our list here, but we should go. Probably people are at their probably gotten to work by now. Absolutely. Um, but we can find you at the weekend homestead on YouTube. Anywhere else? 
Um, I have an Instagram account and actually I've been, I find it easier to post on Instagram. So I'll be doing a project or something and I'll take a couple pictures and it's easy to put them up on Instagram. And then usually I shoot video at the same time and then post that to, uh, uh the weekend homestead out on YouTube. And it's been going really well. A lot of people like what we're doing. So it's been really cool. Cool. Thank you for taking that time, sir. No problem. Anytime. So everyone, um, I think every podcast says this, but would you go to iTunes and give us a rating that uh, seems to help people find us? Or just just email your friends and say, hey, if you like podcasts, try Garden Fork Radio, because our numbers are going up a little bit, which is uh, always surprises me. So make it a great day, everyone. We'll see you later.